Um, I guess we could get started. Thank you so much for coming. This is our kickoff for the spring Yellow Gateway series. As you know, Professor Solomon has been great about bringing in uh, a lot of different speakers in a lot of different disciplines from Yale University, very prominent speakers and really fascinating speakers. So um, I know that many of you have been to several of these events, um, but I do have to do a little bit of housekeeping. We are required to talk about where the fire exits are. So there's doors in the back, there's doors on the side, uh, doors on the side. And actually, I guess we can't get through the wall. Um, the two doors in the back and the doors on the side lead straight to outside. Um, thank you for coming to Yellow Gateway. Professor Solomon is a very well-known journalist. Uh, he has been with the PBS News Hours. You can see him every Thursday night. Uh, in his segment called Making Sense, where he explains so well uh, the, the economy um, in everyday plain terms so everybody can understand it. Um, and really, I, I could talk about all the awards that Professor Solomon has, has earned, uh, but I prefer to just say he's just this great educator, and we're very fortunate in that he's willing to share with all of us. Um, and not only is he willing to share with all of us, it gets even better because he brings his friends and colleagues from Yale uh, to come and visit us and speak about really fascinating topics. So Professor Norma Thompson is, I forgot, the Director of Humanities at Yale. Director of Undergraduate Undergrad. Studies. Yeah, for humanities. Um, and I think I'll let Professor Solomon introduce him. Uh, and, oh, I'm sorry. Oh. Other things I, I forgot that I do have to also say this. So we are recording this. Um, we have our recording policy right there. Just so you know, we are recording this. If there are questions at the end, please face the camera in the back. Do not face the speakers. Face the cameras in the back if you want to, to ask a question. And come up front to ask the question and speak loudly and clearly. Thank you. You can kind of angle yourself. That's the best way to do it. You kind of look that way. You can look back at us as, uh, to write your questions at Nori. Uh, I was thinking about this. I, I didn't uh, consider this until just sitting here. The reason I'm here is largely due to you. Is that right? Yes, it is. Because in 2003, I did a story for the PBS NewsHour at Yale. And... Um, since we are actually fair and balanced, as opposed to some other networks that bill themselves as such, this was a story about uh, the prospective cost of uh, a war in Iraq. This was in March of 2003. And when I asked, where would I get good video and the other side of the story, that is the person whom I was interviewing, seemed to have a negative view of going into Iraq and think, thought it was going to be prohibitively expensive. Um, I was told by a very prominent uh, Yale scholar of um, ancient Greece uh, to go to the grand strategy class where I could actually stage a debate between a guy named Charlie Hill who will be here in uh, in April doing do, doing with me what Nori's doing now, uh, and a guy named Paul Kennedy, who uh, Kennedy is sort of a middle of the road Democrat, fair to describe as uh, Charlie, uh, self described neo conservative, um, and I did that, and then afterwards Charlie came up to me and said. I'm a big fan of yours on the news hour, and my wife is a big fan of yours on the news hour. And it was that emboldened me to call him a number of years later when I was writing something about this very piece. This story I'd done on, on TV, I'd been asked to how do you use stories of mine in a class in the classroom. And I called Charlie, but I only called him because I'd heard that he and Nori were news hour viewers and uh, admirers of my work. And so I felt hmm. confident enough to call him. It was at that phone call in 2007 that he said, what do you do in your spare time? Why don't you come and try teaching at Yale? I taught at Yale for a number of years, then felt that I ought to come here as well. And so literally why I'm here has significantly to do with you. So it all comes back to pizza. 
because I was a fan of yours from the start because you used pizza to describe economics. I could finally oh understand God. something. Do you know how long ago that was? I'm sorry. I'm not going to date myself any <laughs> further. <laughs> that's, that's, that's early 90s. It comes back. New Haven, pizza, it all fits. <laughs> it's, anyway, there, so there you go. So she is a Herodotus scholar, teaches in the Directed Studies program, which is the Great Books program at Yale. I have seen her teach. Uh, obviously, I would say something nice with her sitting here, and I, after all, in, invited her to come, and she was nice enough to accept. But she's a magnificent teacher. She had, the class I saw, literally, the class ran itself. It was on the Lincoln-Douglas debates. And she just had the class. It was about 14 people. And they just, they ran. She had one person who was running the class. And she, like, an occasional comment, but had the class completely operating on its own. So I've been, so the fanning is mutual as between us. Um, and I wanted to come to ask her a question, which I get, I've been asked since I remember being on the street in 1989 in New York and talking to a kid there, interviewing a kid in East New York, one of the roughest places in the country during the height of the, uh, crack, uh, epidemic. Um, and I said to the guy, uh, school, what about school? A kid. And he said, why should I care about dead white people? That's the first time I'd heard that phrase. So that's 27 years ago. Um, so the first question to you is, why should any of us care about dead white men? He said. Is that a question about humanities? I guess, yeah. Yeah, OK. Because not just any dead white men. <laughs> no, no, no. Okay. No, dead white men like Herodotus. Okay. Who, All right. Now I can, now <laughs> I feel enough. comfortable. Right. Uh, because, let's say, my first answer is um, studying the classics, studying humanities is one way to see through the conspiracy of lies. Is that too strong? of the conventional world. It's one way to understand uh, what's really going on in your time. Study someone who was, who was in a different time, who had a completely different perspective, and see what happens. See what happens when you start scrutinizing some of your conventional opinions, the things that you don't ordinarily think about at all. So I would say there's a huge elephant in the room about our culture, about our contemporary scene, and it has to do with how much control we have over our lives, how much control we have over fate, what we can actually take charge of. And I would say when you start working with Herodotus or Plato or Homer or Shakespeare or Jane Austen or any number of great artists or thinkers or uh, historians, whatever the field is, you suddenly are exposed to something that challenges us to the core. You know, we have statistics and they tell you things. You know, science has data, and it tells you how to behave, and it tells you the way things work. And you have social science, and it predicts. And you have polls, and it tells you what's going to happen. And, you know, you go to a doctor, and the doctor's going to fix you. And you go to a law court, and you're going to get justice. And what, what you learn when you study the humanities is that's not actually the way the world works. That's just one big lie. That's just one big covering that we, we human beings consistently put out in order to make our lives a little less scary. But it actually happens to be true that our lives are, are full of uncertainty and that every one of those fields that I just touched upon, science, 
social science, politics, philosophy, literature is based on uncertainty. We don't know things. We don't know what's going to happen. We're constantly shielding ourselves from truths about the human condition. And classics don't let you do that. Whether you're talking about the Iliad or Plato, they will pull you into a world where you don't have the last say about who you are. And you're constantly being subjected to questions about what do you do when every single choice is a price-paying one? You know, Plato's Republic. You want an ideal society. But guess what? Every time you try to get perfect justice, some humanly abominable thing has to be set out. Like we have to take over the kid thing. And, and the raising of kids. Yeah, the raising of kids, and you, we arrange marriages, and you know, you read that book, and it's like, what? What's he talking about? And you get pulled. No in. business. No the businessmen in that in that society. Entrepreneurs, businessmen. Well, the point is, it was the the thought experiment in the Republic was prompted by very idealistic, let's say, college students who want a perfectly just society. And so Socrates is like, okay, come along, follow me. And what they determine as they go through and try to build this is like, whoa, this wasn't exactly what we had in mind. <coughs> and that's what I mean by humanity sort of bringing you up against things that we don't commonly see. It's, a, it's people from different perspectives who make you face human let's say, kind of elemental situations, that nothing's free. You can't have a perfectly just society without X, Y, and Z. So it's that kind of pulling you into a world that makes you uncomfortable. Wait a minute. Nobody made me think about that before. I thought if you were just good-hearted, you could, you could have a great society. And Plato says, no, I'm afraid that's not right. There are all sorts of things that come along the way, and you can pick any author you want. They trouble us. They keep saying, it isn't as easy as you think it is, as we, now I'm talking about contemporary culture, as we pretend that it is. We pretend we're in control. And great thinkers, writers, painters, artists of all time keep saying, no, we're not. No, we're not. There's always these terrible, unbelievable conflicts. Antigone, which way do you want to go? You want to support your brother? Do you want to support the state? And Sophocles is saying, you got to take a choice and make a choice. And guess what? It comes at a huge cost. Now, I'm suggesting that our contemporary situation is one where we are shielded from that world. We, we shield ourselves. For good reasons. It would be really unpleasant to be thinking really scary thoughts all the time. But it's also unhealthy to think of ourselves as controlling our fate in ways that just is not true. But <clears throat> you want us, <clears throat> excuse me, we're not unsettled enough already? We are unsettled. <clears throat> I mean, uh, you, you want me to. Read Herodotus or, well, Plato and Plato's Republic or Sophocles, God for, you know, heaven for fen. You, you want me to read that again and feel even worse? What are we unsettled about? I'm unsettled about ISIS. I'm unsettled about uh, terrorism at home. I'm unsettled about, please, this is off the record, Donald Trump. Uh, <clears throat> I'm unsettled about um, uh, my grandchildren and whether they'll, they, um, and my a son-in-law uh, making an inappropriate choice of a, uh, a, a second uh, partner, perhaps. I mean, I'm unsettled about a, an enormous number of things, right. if truth be known. Yeah. And you're asking me to be more unsettled? No, it's not so much that I'm asking you to be more unsettled as it is to have a deeper or longer understanding 
of why why you're unsettled or take Donald Trump as long as we're off the record. If if you don't understand, we're actually not off the record. I mean, we're, we're completely we're being on the record. <laughs> we couldn't be more we're on, on the record, actually. <clears throat> I know it's true. But if you just study, let's say, contemporary politics, then Donald Trump comes along and it's just not un it's not clear how you peg him into the world of politics. Whereas if you start back with Plato, um, you trace a theme in not just the Western tradition, but let's say all traditions where the human propensity towards what? Egoism, tyranny, absolute power. What happens you know, when different character types take power? Uh, it, it doesn't have to be Plato. It can be any number of, of other or earlier thinkers give you perspective, the sense of we've, not that this is, completely new, but we've seen this before and we have a name for it. And that's what I'm talking about in terms of sort of elemental human conditions. There are sort of predictable human types and they go back to ancient Greece and beyond. And if you have that scope, if you have that expertise or or familiarity with works that go back that far, you start to recognize personalities. You start not to be surprised at certain types. So it's like, or this this guy is like this, this one's like, and they're like interlocutors in Plato's dialogues. They show up there. And so instead of Donald Trump being something like I've never seen before, it's like, oh God, the demagogue from X, Y, or Z. It's just a deeper story. So this is like humanotherapy. I mean, that is, instead of going to psychotherapy because I'm anxious, <clears throat> I don't think I would necessarily need to do that to try to comprehend Donald Trump. But of course, I've read a lot of what yeah. you're talking about. And I suppose it informs my understanding. But, but you're suggesting in a way that <clears throat> it is both unsettling but also grounding. I mean, in that it gives a context to what we see and would otherwise be unnerved well, by because we wouldn't be able to make sense of it. I'm not sure it makes you feel any better. So, so that needs to be said. It doesn't, it's not like it really, you know, helps you get through your day because you've seen this before. It's that the, you know, the, the alternative is to be enslaved to the moment and not to have a way to orient yourself and to be sort of swept up by things that are happening right now as if as if they're ever anew and it's that kind of um, slavery to the present that i feel a horror of the more i study other times and other works and great authors and love certain authors, the more I feel a horror towards being enslaved to your time, You're like not knowing there were earlier versions and that people had uh -huh. thought about things in different ways and that they'd faced perhaps the same kind of struggles or challenges that we're facing right now. And if you, if you don't have that kind of background then what is the basis for judgment when you you're faced with a an election like we're having right now it, it seems to me that if you don't have any kind of background like we're talking about then it's you you are um and perhaps enslaved is is too strong to put it but you you don't have a a lot of um resilience against the emotional appeals that you're hearing. You hear a speech, it sounds good, you're pulled in, you say, yes, that sounds right. 
you're not sure why the next one you you know and it's a kind of emotional rather than um thoughtful reflective but again it's it's, it's not something that's going to make you feel necessarily better about the human condition it's it's just that you you're not swept up by the present presentism to me is really degrading it makes you you know you you feel like whatever is coming over the airwaves is mastering you and you sort of have to go along with whatever you're hearing on the radio on the tv in the paper whatever is out there right now and i i feel a horror of that i feel like that's degrading to human beings and i and i don't like human beings to be degraded i want us to be something inspiriting and and therefore have the ability to talk back to whoever it is and i mean is it government is it in our age is it entertainment you know this is sort of enveloping entertainment world that sort of tells you what matters and you know you want to be able to say uh, i'm not so sure that that's right i'm not so sure that that is the way i want to spend my time or that that's the right focus and so on but <clears throat> let's say we all now read oh i don't know we we reread or re read for the first time plato's republic um or any of the dialogues or whatever any of the authors you mentioned are we not <clears throat> further cutting ourselves off from the culture in which we live let's grant everything you said we'll have more distance we'll certainly have context we'll we won't be enslaved to the moment but right now <clears throat> and I, I try to be as even-handed as I can about Donald Trump, particularly since it's being recorded, but just because that's my profession, and my profession is to always try to see the other side and be even-handed. And I see a person who's talking to a constituency <clears throat> that's not going to ever be reading the classics. In fact, Donald Trump said he really liked, I mean, he says he likes all kinds of things, so I don't know that this is a particularly momentous statement of his, but he did say he really liked uneducated people. I mean, just recently. Um, and to the extent that people like us, people in this room, for the most part, I think, just by being here, uh, are already living in something of a bubble, with respect to at least a significant portion of the American public, right? Um, are we further hermetically sealing ourselves off by reading Sophocles? Hmm. No, I, I don't think we are. Uh, I think... Um... The problem that you're pointing to is a serious one of, of we as a culture don't share, you know, we're not all reading Shakespeare anymore. There, there isn't, there aren't books that we can assume all of our students are reading. And, and that's, that's troubling. So does that mean that I should then, you know, make sure I see all the movies that are current so that I can have some way to reach my students. I think students, I know students find that false and artificial, like you're, tr you're trying too hard in some way to, to be with it in their world. And that isn't convincing. What is- But, but you're teaching Yale students. No, but I teach a lot of students. It isn't just Yale students. I mean, so warrior scholar yeah, students, right, fair when enough. many haven't, <clears> you know, they've had, average high school uh, backgrounds. And I found, I have found, and I've taught in different situations, and I have found that it doesn't particularly matter what great thing it is that you're teaching, whether it's Tocqueville or, or whether it's Sophocles or whether it's Homer, or whether it's Jane Austen. I think it, what seems to matter much more to people and what seems to be communicated immediately is whether that 
um, teacher is genuine and finds something crucial in the work and is able to communicate it. Um, so if students are introduced to Tocqueville, so, so warrior scholars, th these, are, um, these are military people who are transitioning out of the military and, and they have a chance to go into college and they have this short program, one or two weeks that we've been a part of. You teach them small amounts of whatever it happens to be. Very um, intense texts. Yes, very intense. They've got no background in it. And yet, Some, and we've recruited from here. I mean, we've we've been trying to the Warrior Scholar program. We we don't run it. We we just teach in it. But we've been trying to recruit from from Gateway specifically. And I think I've had one or two people. It's like there. it's magical. It, it it's <clears throat> ten pages or fifteen pages, and I can convey to students. You can convey to students what is so important about those pages and what matters today and how formative it was of the American mm -hmm. government. And that is magnificent. And it opens, you know, right, it, you, have an, you have a reaction right away. Well, we've also taught in that course some works that I don't think very well of. They're much more contemporary. They're much more leftist, much more politicized didn't matter to me because what I was looking for and what happened in the classroom was that the students reacted to the works and they saw for the first time, oh, I, I'm a reader. I have an entry point. I have a viewpoint. I can actually argue with this person. And that was the thing that was that is so magical about the warrior scholars. They're taught, the warriors who are tough and accomplished and they've done amazing things, they're scared to death of academia. Mm -hmm. And and all they need to be shown is that this book, this author, this text, these 15 pages say something really critical that involves us today and it connects us to our early history, et cetera, et cetera. So they're suddenly like, oh, this is a challenge, like, like the challenges I'm given out in the field, Afghanistan, wherever they've been, they suddenly see the work as something that they too can fight with, maybe agree with, maybe disagree with, but they have a right to, to talk to it. And that's way more impressive than saying, did you see Downton Abbey and can we talk about that? Not that everything in contemporary culture is, is to be dis dismissed. I can't wait to watch Downton Abbey <laughs> once I tape it all. And I'll, but, but this other stuff, it doesn't take much to show people, any people who are open-minded, what's to be gleaned. But, but then how, <clears throat> all right, so we're not setting our, we're not um, hermetically sealing ourselves. We're not putting ourselves in a bubble by reading Sophocles or Plato or whomever. And you and I are, and in fact, you know, I teach here at Gateway, and that's why I do it, and, uh, to do just what you're saying, which is to reach a group of people who would not normally have as much access to uh, to classic texts, although I don't teach many classic texts, but I certainly, you know, mention them and try to explain some of what's going on. I was, I'm wearing my Adam Smith tie today, and I was explaining uh, Adam Smith's, you know, the the notion of specialization in in the wealth of nations that's only 240 years old or 230, whatever it is, um, 242. Uh, but how we're not win we're not fighting a winning battle here. No, I don't. I don't <laughs> say we are. I mean, what what do we do? How do you? I, I, what she's saying is completely true. That is to say, with these warrior scholars, um, some of whom are not, by the way, cherry picked in the sense that they're, you know, incredibly motivated to begin with to do this program. They're recruited. And that's why we've made efforts to recruit here at, at Gateway, because people are scared and they are not sure how relevant it'll be to them. Uh, and yet, Nor Nori's completely correct to say that once they're in that classroom and feel empowered and see that they're being treated, treated seriously by us or whomever, uh, 
they are totally engaged and committed and appreciative and and they start up. having goals and that's yeah. what i come back to our culture is kind of bankrupt you know it just doesn't inspire people and it doesn't tell people what a good life is or what the choices are it's it's all about be content get entertained you know physical materialist goals and what i find so remarkable about the warrior scholars is they they come in saying i'm not sure what i'm going to do you know maybe i'll maybe i'll work at a health club or something and they come out saying i'm going to study political science because i'm really interested in politics mm -hmm. and i might who knows i might decide to be a lawyer or not, it doesn't even have to be that it doesn't have to be that high of an aspiration it's suddenly to consider your life as something where you can aspire to be to learn to do something that you didn't think of before and that's pretty amazing and that's why we go into teaching to see people transformed to say not only can i learn this i can learn whatever i set my mind to i can learn stuff it's not closed to me but then how do we and i think probably most people or many people in this room <clears throat> have devoted their careers to just this set of aspirations um to be teaching at Gateway, to the extent that there are people, and I know see some people here who are teaching here at Gateway, Gateway are committed to precisely this. But it seems like the Warrior Scholar program is a great program, and it's now go. It's off in I don't know how many different schools, and you know it's spreading like wildfire. But it's still a smattering, right. just a mere smattering of people. How do you, <clears throat> assuming everything you say is true? How how do you propagate the kind of education you're talking about? One person at a time. And I'm not suggesting that we have a victory ahead, Paul, if there's something I'm talking about that should catch on or will catch on. It's really one person at a time in, peop in changing a life. And that might sound pretty pathetic because the numbers are really bad. But I think it's pretty awesome um, to actually have a human being who had kind of glazed eyes and then opens them and then starts thinking, I can read anything. I can train myself to do whatever I want. I can learn stuff. And I should learn stuff. Because And suddenly to see purpose. Um, it's really our our situation is is really bad. I completely agree with you in terms of the potential. But how does anybody become affected by the bug to learn? It's you know, it's it's Plato's Republic. It's the cave. It's a conversion. You turn around and suddenly somebody Somebody who is impressive to you, whether you're, it's a teacher or whether it's a book or it's an idea, something turned you around and the world never looks the same. And that's one person. And yeah, that's pretty bad in terms of numbers. And I don't have a lot of hope for our, I'm scared stiff about our culture, but I love what I do, and I'm completely, utterly committed to it, one person at a time. Well, why, not, why not imagine, given what's happening to technology, and virtual reality is now right on our doorstep, right? I mean, it's already in place in certain, uh, but it, it's going to become widely available available there are at least uh, several systems oculus rift is one there's another uh, from google i think it's from google or amazon i'm not sure <clears throat> but uh you could be and maybe you will be in a classroom or classrooms all around the world right uh 
don't even have to be English speaking because by you know by now the trans right. simultaneous right. translation. Um, and you could be inspiring. Any number of you could be inspiring people. But basically anywhere, like I say, in the world, and goodness knows how many. Now I know there's a difference between having a one-on-one, be able to touch. You know, you're in the room. They, you're looking at them. They know you're looking at them. I understand there's a difference. But in terms of ultimate impact, trying to make a difference in the world, is there a way to package the classics, humanities, call it, let's use those terms interchangeably for the moment, is there a way to package them, do you think, have you thought about? I think about it all the time, and I think the answer is no. Um, Even in a situation like this, which I feel completely comfortable and I can see Everybody, I can kind of catch your eye. If I, like, stare at you, I can make you look at me. Still, I don't know your names. I don't know what you do. I don't have the rapport with this group, even the size it is, is quite small, that I do with my class. To get back to the story that he told at the beginning, um, we were actually in a grand strategy class together, and you said something positive about what had just happened, and I said, "Mm, my class is so much better. I don't even have to teach. <laughs> and and so he's like, okay, you know, I want to see this. I want to see this. So honestly, he came to my class and I didn't, I didn't say anything to my students. It was a regular class and he watched it. I barely opened my mouth yep. and it was so great. Yeah, they, it was amazing. They were awesome. I do. Every not, kid, every kid in the class. Everyone though. talked and it was funny. I remember the class very well. Yeah. I've never forgotten it because I've thought about it so much. I have tried myself to take courses, Coursera, these other, you know, MOOCs. I, there were people at Yale who are famous. They're great lecturers. I was like, oh, would I love to sit in on their classes? Here's my chance. I can do it quietly in my office. I have not managed to finish one lecture of those. And I don't know, is this my failing? Is it my age? Is it how I, I don't know. But I cannot, I cannot be enticed by a lecture on my computer or even any kind of YouTube or any kind of recording. If I'm not in the room, I am checking out. I find myself polishing my nails, dusting my bookshelves, doing all sorts of things except watching the thing in front of me. And that's weird you don't do that in a classroom or i'll call you on and i'm like why are you why are you polishing your nails you know you you have an immediate touch with your students and i don't know how to do that with moocs ted talks you don't watch ted talks i don't how many people here watch ted talks i wish i did all the way through i feel like i would be a better <laughs> a, person just starting to hedge there but so, mo- so most of you do not watch TED Talks, is that right? How many, again, how many people watch TED Talks? Hands right up. How many people do not watch TED Talks? Yeah, that's all right. No, no. And, more, and that's interesting because that's sixty forty. That that's. A, I'm interested in the age thing too because <laughs> I've been worried. Is it's just the white haired people who can't get used to it? But there are some very young people who say they don't. I don't know. I'm I'm, inter- I'm very interested in it because I I love it that the whole world has access to all sorts of things. I just don't think it's the same. When I think of what really touched me, what really transformed me, it sure wasn't a lecture class on Plato or Aristotle. It absolutely was not. What did? It, it was David Green, my teacher in graduate school, who came to class. He with with horse shit on his boots he'd been out he he ride he would ride horses he was such an irish farmer he goes to ireland he would go to ireland half the year and then he'd be in chicago but he knew herodotus he knew he said he knew these guys as a farmer you know farmer to farmer and he also knew greek better than anybody in the whole world but he was just this you know person whose life absolutely um reflected, lived, um, personified the people he was studying. Like they were real, really real presences to him and he made them come alive in the classroom. He was crazy. I remember the first class I sat in on 
it was a Homer class. It was on um, the Odyssey, which I had not read. And so I was quickly preparing before <laughs> class, like, oh, I got to catch up to everybody. I've never read this. And he gets, the first thing he says is the son, Telemachus. He says, I never liked that boy. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> wow. <laughs> you can say that? Like, that's literary <laughs> criticism. I never liked that boy. I didn't like him either. And I thought, but that's what I'm talking about. Somebody who, who cared so much about the works that they were personal in the sense that, like, he knew these characters. They were people that close to him. Suppose, yeah. but suppose, suppose you could take David Green, and um, and this will happen, and this will happen. I, I don't know how soon it'll happen, but it'll happen, and we'll have like Princess Leia in the first Star Wars. David Green will be here, and he'll be there'll be a hologram of David. You, you Green. You wouldn't be able to smell what was on his boots. Well, well, we could do we could do sense around or something. We yeah. could you know aromatherapy oh, or we. We we can't get we can't get ev- everything yeah. yet, but we will. But presumably, well, let me say, let me say something else. So when I went to the the first class, they were always at night, and it turned out that there were like fifteen people who were attending this class who were living in Chicago and had jobs and and families and everything else. They'd never really left the University of Chicago. Now that might be kind of a University of Chicago thing. No, there are other schools. I mean, but, Harvard's but, like, like that. People would never stop coming to David Green's classes. So it wasn't just the cohort that you came with. It was years and years of people who refused to leave. They just thought, I'm never going to miss a class that he teaches on any topic, whether it's Shakespeare or he see it. I'm never going to miss it for the rest of my life. And they didn't. And there's something about seeing people make that statement week after week that makes you think this person really values ideas and the ideas from this book. And I would really like to know what he sees in this book because I am intrigued by that level of love of author text and so on. Now, jump ahead many decades. I'm in New Haven. I get called to jury duty, murder trial, block north or so. And something phenomenal happened with that jury that reminded me of graduate school and seminars, which was you're stuck in a room with people you don't want to be with. You're, you're given this horrible murder case. And it makes no sense in the courtroom. And you, you're sent to the de- deliberation room. And suddenly with these 12 people bickering, yelling, arguing, debating back and forth, it's like, whoa, this is kind of like graduate school. We are getting closer to something we think is the truth. We're getting a really compelling story where what we heard in the trial was not so compelling. and it, and to me, it's like, it's a small number of people in a room arguing in good faith. Something really amazing happens. And that's why seminars, personal seminars, are so awesome. The jury embodies it. And it's a shame that we're, the American system is kind of letting it slip away. But I experienced it in New Haven even though it was a terrible outcome, blah, 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 it was utterly transfixing to see 12 strangers come to a higher assessment and a better narrative, a stronger story than what we'd been given. And I was like, that's what happens when you're in a seminar. You open yourself up to criticism. You, you test other people. You laugh if somebody says something stupid. You just keep building on things. You don't really go in there ready to say something, but something about the conversation pulls it out. And before you know it, you have an incredible achievement. Now, not all seminars are like that. Sometimes they fall flat. But the point is, it can happen. And we know what the, we call it brainstorming in other situations. But I think that's related to the earlier question about why MOOCs aren't really doing the job and why if you really, really, really are going to get the spell 
of a seminar, it has to be in a small situation with people with good faith who want to understand something and are willing to put themselves, to expose themselves, to say, you know, in some way, I don't really understand this, but this is what I think. And you could be made to look foolish. But on the other hand, you might really spark something that makes you see the, the work, the idea in a completely different way. So you, so I'm sitting here and I'm literally thinking, okay, she's convinced me. I was reasonably convinced before, but more so even than before. I'm convinced that we ought to be reading the classics and I'm certainly validated to the extent that I do. Uh, and I certainly, and I used to audit classes for years and going to another university for a couple, about nine weeks. And that's what I want to do is audit classes at that university coming up in the spring. Um, and I'd love to, if I had time, to be auditing classes here at Yale. But you're also making me feel terrible in that I'm thinking, if you're right, and it has to be this intense interpersonal, non-technology mediated experience, then we're screwed because no greater percentage of the country is getting that experience. Only 30% of Americans get a four-year degree. That number is not going up. Might be going up slightly for younger people, but it's not clear that that isn't because the requirements for getting a four-year degree aren't easier to meet, right? And that a large part of our uh, increase in population is immigrants, and a large percentage of those immigrants are from places where people do not typically get four-year college degrees. So there's some argument that we will be, see the percentage go down from 30%. But it's still only 30%. And in most of those colleges, people are not getting David Green or you are not even in seminars. They're, in fact, in large lectures where they can do their nails and nobody will notice and are basically shopping online mm -hmm. unless they're forbidden from bringing a laptop in. And, hey, you don't need a laptop anymore. I can shop online on my on this and nobody will know, right? I, I really, I haven't done it, I should say, but I, uh, but I could. Mm -hmm. So you're just making me feel... I know you weren't, I didn't invite you well, here to you, make me feel better, but you're making me feel worse. When, once you um, share this insight that small gatherings um, around a shared interest is the way to go, it's so easy to recreate in a million different ways. This is Warrior Scholar, same thing. We, st you know, yes. so that's a completely different. Although way. huge effort. All right, but all right, so I'll give you some other examples. So at, in my building, we have something called the Whitney Seminar now, which is just find some Yale professor and ask that person to give a seminar once a month to faculty. No papers, no tests. Show up once a month and talk about Shakespeare or opera or whatever your field is so that you're not studying, you're not preparing extra stuff you're just coming in so that the the latest one was ellen roseanne who does opera and she's got 12 or 15 yale people from every discipline under the sun science non-science social science humanities just people who want to come and talk about opera and are willing to be led by her for six or eight months so that's easy. six or eight months well once a month so you get six or eight opera you know from from september until may and how easy is that? It's actually pretty easy. And now you're saying, okay, well, so this is a this is a population of, of professors. Fine. Yeah. So so I play tennis. You know that. I, I get I do. downhearted. Better than I do. Round about November, when I'm not playing outdoors anymore. So my friends and I, as we're on the terrace, 
bemoaning the fact that it's November and we won't be able to play tennis outdoors for a long time, decide, okay, every first Tuesday of every month, one of us is going to talk about something, whatever it is. So Carol the baker or Deb the banker or Nori the Play-Doh reader, whatever it is you want, give us a small, very, very small piece of reading and, we, and we'll have these meetings. We're called the Barfly Scholars, BS for short. It's so much fun. And w people just step up whatever, whatever their expertise, expertise is, or perhaps it's a hobby or whatever it is, and just you know talk about it and, and have other people talk about it. This is a pretty economical model, I would say. I mean, given how much we spend on technology for educating students, if we just thought in these kind of terms, I don't think it's unreasonable to, to, to say it could, it could have an impact for not that much money. And you don't need experts. What you need is people who care about books or ideas or things or notions. How many of you are in reading groups? That is the model I'm talking about. You decide what you're going to read, what you're going to talk about. You don't need to have an expert there. Sometimes amazing things comes out of those. And once you start doing those groups, this is Tocqueville. Once you start doing that, you do one of them, you're like, let's, let's form a group. Let's do another one. That's America at its core when it started. Self-starters just do it. Just make an organization and... Learn how to do it if you don't know how to do it. Is that possible to do now? I mean, of course, it's possible. And people in this room, I'm sure, think, you know, but you're, these are people who are already motivated to come here of the evening to listen to somebody talk about, you know, why you should read the classics. I mean, again, I, I'm not trying to win an argument here, and I'm not trying to make everybody as depressed as I currently am, you know. Uh, for the moment here, I'm generally, as some of you know, a very up upbeat, uh, uh, happy guy, uh, and gratified. And, um, for many of the reasons, you know, but because I pursue many of the very things you're talking about and have insistently pursued them throughout my entire life and continue to, but I'm thinking kids don't read, uh, we're up again. Plato is up against Oh, you know, Beyonce, uh, who's a genius, but who's and who, you know, introduces you certainly in in her later in her latest video, introduces you to a world that you're probably not. Many of us are not familiar with. Uh, but it's it's the current world. It's certainly not giving you. I don't think you could argue. Uh, perspective on let's say the trump phenomenon except in the sense that there's people reacting against <laughs> videos like beyonce's um I, I don't see I, you know we have this warrior scholar program but i don't see this happening more i don't see more de tocquevillian you know aggregations i see less of it yeah so do i i i am again not uh, promoting any kind of um, you know, false hope here, but I do see a lot of idealism uh, among young people. I don't think that's new. So why not tap into it? Uh, there are all sorts of students at Yale that, that I know well who who want to go back, want to give back. I mean, that's the that's really the byword, and it's all right. So what can we do to go you know, like? New Haven Public Schools, what can we do to teach or to coach? And I'm not trying to save the world, but if you can save your little part of it or just just feel that you're making a dent and, and maybe making it possible for some people to see further than they otherwise would because of our bankrupt culture, that's pretty amazing to do. Can you... Can you imagine getting, I don't know, New Haven Public Schools 
um, I don't know, kids. I mean, Gateway already, you've got people who are striving, who are striving to go to four-year schools. So it's a large part of why people are here. I mean, is to, is to take this, that step. It's less expensive, obviously, to do it here. It's also a way to be able to work and, you know, go to school because of the expense of going to school. Yeah. So it's cheaper and you, the opportunity cost isn't as high. But I'm I'm just having trouble imagining, and I see you're not reassuring me, uh, that there's a way of using you and all the other people who, well, all the other students at Yale who might know enough about Plato to have a discussion with people who don't know anything about Plato, reading five pages, you know, two pages, whatever. Uh, starting them on this, yeah. turning them around in the cave, but to use your uh, your excellent well, image. You know, uh, so I am the director of undergraduate studies in the humanities major. There is a humanities major at Yale. And for the first time, we are starting a program this summer whereby we're going to offer a two-week course. Did you hear about this? Yeah, uh, Brian told me. Okay, that. so... Um, New Haven. He because he met with uh, Lorraine over there. Great. So you know this already. Um, we'll see. You know. And we'll explain to people. I'm well, so we're going to do like a mini version of what I've been talking about. I'm not even sure what's going to be on the syllabus. I think. But it's here, right? Here, it, here. There. Well, bro, maybe it's a different thing you're talking about. So. Yeah. Could Brian be. is trying to. It, Brian has talked to you. Brian. Oh, it hasn't yet. No. Well, anyway, there's a. I thought you were talking about a plot that is afoot to have there be a, more of a connection between Yale and Gateway. Well, that very well could be. There could be many plots. The plot I'm talking about has to do with attracting um, uh, high school students. No, I didn't know that. In, in New Haven schools who are unlikely or do not have a history of people going to college in the family and we're trying to pull them into this program it's competitive it will be free to them they will stay in at in dorms on on the campus and take a course take a take have a little version of what we're talking about and probably mostly literature um, but classical literature and introduce them to a world that they have never seen before now, who knows what's going to happen with it? I just think it's a really great idea. I Why not try it? Um, there's a bunch of us who are sort of perpetually idealistic on this topic and think, you know, all I have to do is get a few people in the room with Plato or Homer or Herodotus, and I'm bound to succeed in interesting the students. It's not me. It's the book. It's the serious stuff that they're doing in these texts. And it's way more serious than Beyonce. And the students know it within two minutes. And they want to hear more because they want to have a good life, a deep life. They want to know something that's more respectful than what they see around them, which is trash. Sorry, but our culture is a lot of trash. And so they're introduced to something that Whatever it is, it's really strange. I'm sure it hits them as bizarre. I remember the feeling myself. It's something that stops you in your tracks. And you say, there are other ways of looking at the world than the way our culture is. Why not give this one a go? Just, just to see. Mm -hmm. Because it's not going so well with us. People are not so wonderfully satisfied and happy and content with their lives in our century in America or in the West or in the world. So let's just consider other possibilities. Hmm. I'm happy with that. I know I'm not saving the world. I'm really happy if I can do something in New Haven that would change people and give some hope to people who didn't have it before, give some direction. You know, it, it, one thing that strikes me, and I, I wonder how you react to this. I think a, an important part of 
uh, I'm going to go back to the Donald Trump phenomenon here, but an important part of his constituency is a large group of Americans, and there's somewhere around, I mean, right now on the prediction markets uh, where people are betting on the outcome of the election, um, the the best guess is that uh, the current price is that he would get about, um, I think it's about 44% of the vote and the, 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 the Republican candidate will get 44% of the vote and the a Democratic candidate will get 56. That's, that's the number as of just, well, I don't know, a couple of hours ago, actually. Um, there's a market in Iowa where people are, are betting, are, making, are, are betting on this and betting not just who's going to win, but on the actual vote uh, share. Um, and it, so let's say a number of those people are people who are just going to vote Republican anyway, would never vote for Hillary Clinton, a presumptive candidate. And so, but somewhere 30% of America, 40% of America, somewhere in there, uh, with Donald Trump's a favorable rating, let's use that. That's 30% according to Gallup as of the last week. So 30% of Americans view him favorably. And it strikes me, I'm sorry this is such a long-winded question, but it strikes me that a lot of those people think that people like you and I and other people in this room think that they're stupid because they have never read Shakespeare, Herodotus, whatever. They've heard of Shakespeare, but never heard of Herodotus, much less Telemachus or Sophocles. Is there a way, or are you suggesting that what you're trying to do is get them over that intellectual status hump? If, you, if that question doesn't seem too badly phrased. Because what I'm seeing over the course of my entire repertorial career, which is 46 years now, and as a business journalist, 38 or 39, is a separation between those of us who read Herodotus, let's say, and who then marry someone who reads Herodotus and then have kids who we force or try to induce to read Herodotus. And that that divide has been growing and growing. And then there's occasional effort like Warrior Scholar or what you're trying to do, but, yeah. the, but you're bucking, you're bucking yeah, I mean, you're coming back at me in various ways with the same mm -hmm. question, <laughs> mm -hmm. which is, aren't things really, really bad in these different ways of, you know... The, Specifically with regard to the question of the evening, which is, you know, why should we read the classics? Yeah, yeah. And, and there is a divide right now that's worrisome and growing worse and that seems to be responsible for the kind of uh, climate, that, political climate that we're seeing. So no question that you're you're right about that. And there are any number. I mean, it, it's a it's a difficult issue to uh, come to terms with in one way because there's so many different elements. To, yes. To how how this has worked over the years, but it's it's concerning in the utmost. Um, so. Again, my feeble response is every effort that you can make to bring that closer to to uh -huh. erase what seems to me to be an artificial divide. Uh -huh. It is not true that people who never encountered these texts can't have any access to them. I mean, you, it just requires attention, and you know that's what I try to do no matter who the population is. So, you know, I'm, I am, I, I'm answering your, your question in the same way. I'm Tocquevillian, which is to say, I think you really want to concentrate on local 
um, local improvements. And that's the best thing you can do is starting with your neighborhood, your area, who you can reach, what's possible, and and erase that that really toxic divide that is suddenly so visible in America. I mean, isn't it shocking? Yeah. I mean, it's like, it's just opened up before our eyes. Well, you know, the, I, I, on Friday, I'm, I'm going to uh, Washington and I'm going to interview uh, a friend of mine, um, a guy who's become a friend of mine, a guy named Charles Murray, an extremely conservative. Um, and, I, and I'm not conservative at all. Um, extremely conservative uh, political thinker. Um, he wrote a book um, three or four years ago, and I did a story with him about that book. It's called Coming Apart. He he was accused of having of being um, racist in earlier work he'd done. He was famous for a book called The Bell Curve in the late 90s, talking about the heritability of IQ. Um, so he restricted this book that coming apart strictly to white culture and white America and described in that the same, uh, coming apart, yeah. the classification or reification of classes in America. And in that book, <clears throat> he put it on a, he had a quiz, which you can go back home and and access because I put it online. Uh, it was called "Do You Live in a Bubble?" Just a quiz with a whole bunch of questions. Here's what the typical white American, typical meaning, you know, average white American, uh, uh, mainly man, because the there, there were a number of sports questions on here, uh, knows. How do you score? And he he created it, um, and. It was only the other day that I thought, oh, my God, he was telling me then, he was telling us then that this, he was predicting what was going to happen. Mm -hmm. Because the scores that I and the people who on the who news hour readers got, we had them tally their scores online. That's no longer there to some technological snafu. But were sadly low, or not sadly low, but at any rate, we were out of touch with who the NASCAR guy was and which bands on the military uh, on your, you know, uh, which was a captain and which was a lieutenant and, you know, what are the rankings and all these, and do, do you know anybody who ever worked in a factory and so forth and so on. It was those kinds of questions. It is those kinds of questions. And he was trying to show the difference. And sure enough, I mean, my, you know, I think of myself as a super cosmopolitan guy and I, I got some lame O score on this, on this test. And yet so many people we know, I'm sure that, and you know, go, where did this Trump thing come from? Where, well, this has been happening for a long time, right? Uh, so uh, that's where I get worried about whether or not we're sealing ourselves off. Let's have people who have questions. Please come up if you would. And remember, you angle. Okay, so you're angling towards the camera there. We're listening to you, and you can occasionally make eye contact with us. The camera sees the back of my head. Is this, this on? Yeah, I, I was fascinated with the uh, your discussion about the bubble. And my uh, little theory is uh, great literature classics are produced in a bubble, and that it's essential that there be a bubble. And I'll just talk about the Republic for a minute, Plato's Republic. You had the Peloponnesian Wars going on. Uh, Athens was in disarray. I don't think uh, Plato's uh, Republic uh, was a bestseller in Athens at that time. Uh, Hemlock was very popular. <laughs> and uh, so you were talking about 30% of the population today. Probably when uh, the Republic was written by, by Plato, it, it was probably even less than 30%. Uh, and 
as you were talking about the bubble, and I agree with everything you, you've said, but as, as you were talking about the bubble, uh, it kept on this simplistic thing in my mind kept on saying, well, you know, history keeps repeating itself over and over and over, and it's good to be knowledgeable about, and uh, perhaps uh, it is good to be uh, somewhat nervous. Uh, all of a sudden now everybody's interested in using the term uh, existentialism. They don't even know what it means. Existential politics and this and whatever. It's, it, it's be, unfortunately, it's become a buzzword. Uh, so I guess what I'm just trying to say is I think, maybe I'm wrong, but I think uh, a lot of literature is created in its own time period in a bubble. And then uh, throughout history, it grows. Uh, but Athens was not a pleasant place for Plato or Sophocles. That was, it was deathly for them. And uh, so I would probably encourage people to accept the bubble as a positive, not as a negative. Uh, and, and, uh, and creators. And I think even during Shakespeare's time was troubled. So could it be that the bubble is an essential uh, prerequisite to writing great literature? And then perhaps later on it becomes more popular driven, but that, that's my question. Is, is, it a, is it a negative? I, I kind of think of it as a positive. And I, I, I don't know why we're so enamored to try to get this across to everybody in the universe. It's never going to happen. It's never going to happen. And I think, I think it, uh, lit uh, literature and education is a personal thing. It's not a mass media type product. Anyway, that's my So I would say um, that uh, I'm, Thank you. political theory is, is my field, first and foremost. Um, and there really isn't a great political theorist who wasn't in a time of, I'm not going to say a bubble, I will say trouble, in a time of trouble, which is quite different, which is to say, all right, Plato, Peloponnesian War, uproots everything. There's a, there's a cultural revolution in, its, in the basic sense going on. It's kind of poetry versus philosophy in Plato's terms, but really it's a realist world, a materialist world, power, Athens, hegemony versus the old traditional pieties. Um, and if you play that out over time, you know, while Aristotle and Thomas Hobbes with the Amada and uh, Locke and Rousseau and all of these great political theorists are writing at a time when everything about their world is being shaken up and rethought and that does seem to me to be really critical like there are certain times that inspire radical thinking because everything is being reconsidered so i think we just what i would want to do is just separate our terms here yes you are completely right about the time of troubles i think that's a that's a wonderful support of deep thinking because it means whatever you grew up thinking you you know you have to rethink things are so in such upheaval that you can't count on anything that you learned from your parents or your tradition or your religion or x y and z so there so so that there's really new thought going on now that's really different than a bubble when you think of a bubble protects you you're not aware mm -hmm. you're in your own world um, and that's your that's what you keep coming back to like if if we're in our own world holding on to plato holding on to homer holding on to these works jane austen i read jane austen before i go to bed am i in a bubble you bet i want to sleep <laughs> you know <laughs> so in a certain so does he, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. That, that's his point yeah uh please Here, uh, uh, Could you name a period that didn't have trauma and uh, political excitement and uh, disaster from ever? I mean, just is there a period in history you can name 50 years long, 100 years? I don't know. Exactly. So it's like yeah, Middle Ages, ever... Dark Ages, these kind of things. So in a but... sense, every, anybody who's a classic perforce wrote in one of those periods. No, but you can tradition. actually look at the wars. You can actually look at the battles. You can actually look at well, times of... John Stuart Mill, I was pretty quiet when he was writing for that little period, but that's about the only one I can think of. 
everybody else. Yeah, and then we have to argue about John Stuart Mill. Is he a great thinker? Like. <laughs> well, and to talk about those 1830s, right, in this country. Well, you know what? That was as so, quiet as it gets. In no, but, but you know what it, You know what I would say about him is that that's comparable. It's not like an explosive world situation, but it's that he is an aristocrat. He's deeply, completely in the world of aristocracy in France, a whole lot of stuff going on in France. He comes over to America. He sees democracy is the way. So he's on this cusp. He he knows the world that he came from is disappearing. He's not really thrilled about a lot of things in democracy that he sees, but he knows it's coming. And that kind of vision. Yeah, and he's about 70% wrong in everything he uh, said. He suggested that. I don't uh, think so. Well, he said this country wouldn't have uh, science, theoretical science, would only have practical science. And if you look at who won the Nobel Prizes in physics for the last 50 years, it's Americans. I mean, he, you know, he's just wrong. It's like he, he was so afraid. Well, the question is whether Americans are more practically oriented than theoretically. I think he's right on that one. I couldn't disagree more. I think that that's, <laughs> that's kind of like tarot cards. It's like you'll meet a stranger. It's like everybody is a stranger. It's a kind of shooting fish. Sorry, I didn't mean to argue about the topic. No. I actually wanted to mention one other thing about uh, you say you have to read the classics to appreciate contingency. And I, I agree that that's a great way to get it. But if you are even half awake and paying attention or reading modern philosophy, but if you're just paying attention, like, you know, your basic person who's a pipe fitter knows all about contingency. Uh, a housewife who was just raising kids and has never read a book in her life mm -hmm. knows about contingency. It's like you learn that. You don't need the classics to learn that right, particular Right, right. No, I think. And if anything, academics, uh, you know, yeah. are living in the bubble. And they probably appreciate it less than the common. Man. I think that's right. I think that's, that's you know, and, and when I, if I'd go on and might talk about the jury, it would be to support common sense reasoning when it comes up in that sense. And in my particular case, a lot of it came from kind of working class people. There were four Yale professors on this jury, so it was a very wow. classist jury. And And yeah, what we really lacked was common sense and what I loved is when the wow, this is a play you could make yeah uh, <laughs> 12 cultured <laughs> right four cultured and six nine. four <laughs> Yale professors in wow. a in a Harvard lawyer wow yeah I know that's an amazing experience yeah I love guess what happened <laughs> we hung we couldn't decide is that right <laughs> yeah There's been some I thought you meant you hung the person who <laughs> committed the murder <laughs> you have a murder Jesus yeah. yeah there's some pretty awful yeah. Murders. Anyway, yeah. I, yeah. I think that's all I had to say. But uh. so, but but to just follow up on the question, I mean, you, you're welcome to sit back down. To follow up on the question, so what is it that a person, the I don't quite like the the image of the housewife who hasn't read anything. Let's go with a pipe fitter. Yeah. The um, the unschooled mm -hmm. pipe fitter who understands contingency because he understands the extent to which he's dependent on his next job and the economy and whether or not there's going to be housing or new housing construction, et cetera, et cetera. And that's what I assume you mean by contingency. Fit, right. right. Un un unschooled, I yeah. said. Not, I, 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 all right, so not yeah. unschooled. Hasn't read the classics. How's that? Um, that's all I meant. No, I can so, step in now if you want. I get, I get the question and I yeah. get the point. I think, and it's very well. So, taken. so then, so then, what what's in it for? What's in it for him? He already understands contingency. He's scared in legitimate well, ways. I I just think it's it's he's not. Um, he's not protected from the kind of thing I'm talking about, even if he's not indulging in it. Think of medicine. Now, I'm involved right now with a bunch of school, Yale School of Medicine doctors who are dissatisfied with the kinds of education that medical students are coming to medical school with. What is their education? It's all science. It's as if Every person who was going to be in med is told 
if you don't get an A in, you know, orgo, in every single physics, biology, every single science course, you are not capable of being a doctor. Is organic chemistry now called orgo? Yeah, it was in my school, but whatever. Yeah, okay. That, I so just didn't know. The, the point is, there are a bunch of people in medical school who are saying, whoa, undergraduate, please. We don't have any room for it in medical school because everything is, is so completely regimented. But can't the pre-meds take courses and things beyond science? Because, and here's the punchline, medicine is about non-scientific issues. It's constantly about uncertainties, about judgment calls, about not knowing and having to figure things out. And so they're coming to us and say, can we have pre-meds study uh, Sophocles? where you are taught that every choice has a price, that there are consequences, that you can't live in this world where it's black and white. It's not a clear scientific decision so many times in, in medicine. So it seems to me that even your pipe fitter or whoever, we're, we're, there are these kind of ideologies or some some kind of, I don't know if ideology is the right word, but there are mystiques that we we do this. We start saying everything in science, everything in medicine is about certainty. Well, when's the last time you've known someone who was sick and you've been in the medical world? How much uncertainty is there when you're in? Everybody who has any practical experience knows that medicine is full of uncertainties. It's not a science in the way it's presented, but we seem to like to present it that way. And I think that this is one example of many. Law, same thing. You want to get rid of the juries because you don't want people making judgments. You want it to be DNA, you know, blood tells you who's guilty and who's not. Guess what? That's not the way it works. In every single profession, we seem to want to make things smoother, more certain than they are. And so even if you have a very on-the-ground, practical job, I think that this is a propensity that all of us have to, have to deal with and have to worry about in our world because it's all over the place. And so, Joe, the pipe fitter is likely to be, he may understand contingency, the contingencies of the world, but he's also drawn to the most simple or simplistic view. And that's where the Donald Trump uh, constituency well, comes from. I mean, because if if they'd simply, read Sophocles, they wouldn't be for Donald Trump? No, no, no. I'm not I'm saying that asking. at all. I'm, I'm really... I'm, I'm suggesting that there are so many areas in human life where things are much more complicated than we let on. And medicine is a great example that all of us have practical experience with. If you've ever known anyone who was sick and there was some mystery about what the illness was, you know what kind of world we live. How about someone who's dying? Have we had that experience? Do we know the difference between our human knowledge and the kind of stuff that comes at us from the medical field. And I'm just suggesting that is all over the place. I just want to, there's an underlying theme that runs through this, that by reading the classics, you automatically gain some perspective. And I cannot remember the aphorist that says it, but uh, somebody once pointed out that books are like mirrors. If an ass looks in, an apostle doesn't look out. <laughs> Uh, it was a German guy. I can't remember his name. But anyhow, you know. If an ass. If an ass looks in, an apostle doesn't look out. The point. The point. Does not look out. The apostle. Uh, an apostle does apostle not look. An apostle does not look. It's a mirror. Books uh. are mirrors. Um, you know, it, it doesn't automatically make you gender no, it spirited doesn't. or. Or have great perspective. Nothing automatic about it. Nothing automatic about it. And I was going to say, John Dewey is big on the notion that you don't read books to be improved. You read them to see you further, as you say. And I was going to say, there's, again, this one of the ironies of historical knowledge is you have to get some to understand why you might need it. You know, it's a catch-22. It's like if you had, don't have it, you don't understand why it would change your perspective. And then as soon as you do have some, 
as you say, you start wanting to go deeper. That's the way it works. But and the job, you're you're right. The teacher wants to get them that first step. And you know, it, it we do live in a culture that doesn't really ask that kind of effort of people because it takes a long time to mm -hmm. read the book. It does. It's easier to do easy things. And to to Beyonce, she is fabulous, and there's a lot of knowledge in there, and it is in no way any shallower than anything you'll pick up anywhere else. And I was going to say, it isn't all junk. Uh, I didn't say it was junk. Nope, somebody said the popular culture is all junk. No, 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 no. I said, it was, said, that. I said it was trashy. There you go, trash. And I would just say. I didn't say I that. stand by that. <laughs> There's some things going on or have gone on. like. I didn't say that wasn't true. I it, and we don't know right now what it is that in 100 years they're going to be saying David Lynch, you know, changed the 21st century or Bob Dylan or, you know, whoever your favorite popular culture figure is. We don't know who's a genius right now, 100 years from now. People come and go, as you pointed out at the start. You know, existentialism is making a big comeback, but you know his star is. Remember, existentialism is used. The term existentialism is used two ways, and and the way it's used most commonly now is there's an existential threat. That's not the same as existentialism. It's a completely different meaning. Right. I know. Um, you know, people's stars rise and fall, and but Herodotus makes it go away. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, yeah, I Thank think Herodotus you. has a better shot than Beyonce. I, 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 I'm on record on on camera. I'm on camera as having said Beyonce is a genius. But uh, please. Yeah, go to that one. It's got to be easier. I don't really want to be yeah. anywhere, but um, why? Would, and close to the. Why wouldn't we start at the earliest age possible, introducing a captive audience in the K through 12 system instead of feeding them contemporary trash, which is so common in uh, reading in the public system? Why wouldn't we start with classics or reintroduce them if we want to change and improve? Well, they're, they're not, no one's asking me <laughs> um, what we should be doing. Um, so that's a huge question about what we're doing, how we can change this so much. I don't know. All I'm saying is that it's not too late wherever we start. And I, I don't know what the, I'm not an um, education speci specialist, so... I don't really know what we should be doing in nursery school and kindergarten, but I know the American system of primary education is broken, and um, we do a lot better in college. Look, one thing is that there's a huge incentive, an enormous, a huge incentive uh, to probably more a greater incentive than there is to do anything else in this culture, which is to get people's attention and keep it. Uh, and so the incentive is people follow that incentive. And so when you're trying, you, if you're trying to teach a kid to read uh, Herodotus, since it's your specialty and you've given a shout out to Herodotus back there, um, you're up against not just Beyonce, but all sorts of other things, all sorts of other appeals to attention, SpongeBob, SquarePants, <laughs> um, a family guy, on and on and on. And so I have grandchildren and one of them's 14 and one of them's 12, and I'm absolutely committed to trying to get them to be serious mm. and to ha to read. Uh, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't dream of starting with or trying to get them even to read the Odyssey. Yeah. Uh, so I sucker them with a, you know, something that will already that already connects to them. And this is the answer to your question, I think. Um, the so that they'll be motivated to read, <laughs> period, right? Just get them to be reading. And then I'm hoping 
that I'll be able to. <laughs> well, exactly. I mean, I didn't read Herodotus until I was in graduate school, and I was a history major in college. Now, that's pathetic, but it's why I turned to Herodotus. I was a history major, and I, would, I didn't get it. Why isn't anybody talking about what is history? What should we remember? How did anybody decide this? And I was so puzzled during my whole history major about who had come up with these methodologies and these historiographies, and it, I never saw it argued. And so I had this lack as I was leaving college. I wanted to know something about historiography. There had been no classes like that. I had not taken any ancient history. I had not taken Herodotus or Thucydides. And so I heard about them, you know, after the fact. And it was basically my ignorance that spurned me to read. It was like, oh, here's the guy that I've been looking for. This is why I've been dissatisfied, because I didn't know how it started, and I wanted to ask those really basic questions, elemental questions about, you know, the first one. How did you ever come up with, with what is worth memorializing? So I think Paul's right. There is a time for these things. I mean, early education has to be more just interesting kids in stories and making them want to read stories and be thirsty for things that they're interested in. But I know my what might come across as my <laughs> kind of fanatic devotion to great books came about because I didn't read any in college. <laughs> and I felt the lack of it. And I, I wanted later to fill in the gaps. And I met these people at the University of Chicago that I was so impressed with. I, w I wanted to be like them. They cared about ideas. They cared about these authors, like I said, like they're, like they're family members or something. I mean, they had such a close knowledge and affiliation with these texts. I wanted to be like that. I wanted to be somebody who cared that much about ideas. And so I kept pushing and going backwards and going backwards until I'd finally at a certain point pretty much gone through the canon, but it was all after the fact. It was all filling in, and what did I miss, and what haven't I still read, and which Shakespeare is still ahead of me. I mean, this kind of thing, at least I, I have a drive because I felt the inadequacy of my education, and I didn't have a bad education. It was a pretty good one, and yet I, you know, I felt so many omissions, giant human omissions. I, bit in the most basic questions hadn't been addressed. And so I, I come across as something of a fanatic now because I want students to have to, you know, not to have to go through what I did and, you know, take a sensible great books program when you're a freshman and you'll make your life ever so much easier in terms of being able to plug things in and know what you're reading and know what you're looking for. I think we've exhausted our audience. <laughs> <laughs> but, but thank you so much, Norman. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks for thank coming. You. Thank you very much for coming. It is time, actually. <laughs> so thank you very much for coming. And we're going to have another event on April 4th. Um, Sam Hussein is going to be talking about April 4th, yeah. Sam Hussein's going to be talking about uh, the counterintelligence threats in our nation, security threats. So please, spread the word.